Welcome to Jack Kirby's History of the Future. If you can't stay till the end of the lecture, these are the dates you need to know. And here's a photo of Jack Kirby. Kirby was our most successful futurologist. He wrote and drew science fiction comics and has a 100% record of successfully predicting the future. He began making predictions in his science fiction comics in 1940 when he predicted the atom bomb, and he made predictions about space travel, computers, all the usual stuff. Oh, by the way, this is an old Victorian timeline of world history. It's been extended to include up to the 1980s. That's when I bought my copy. Now, Jack Kirby really understood his history. I mean, he really understood history, especially the 12,000 year cycle. Kirby used his deep understanding of the cycles of history in the rise and fall of civilizations to predict the future of our own civilization. He even predicted dates. He said, this will happen in the year 1975. This will happen in the year 2000. This will happen in the year 2020. And when those dates arrived, the thing happened exactly as Kirby said it would. Oh, hi, you weren't supposed to see my feet. Uh, my name's... Oops, sorry, not supposed to see my glasses either. My name's Chris Tolworthy. This video is about my book. What's it called again? <laughs> Jack Kirby's History of the Future. I hate making videos. If, this is why... Do not subscribe to my account, because you'll not see any other videos for about 10 years. Okay, uh, it's about Jack Kirby's History of the Future. I'm going to start with a little bit about the 12,000 year cycle of history. A uh, little bit about Jack Kirby, who he was. A very little bit about me, who I am, and my books. And then most of this video is going to be a chapter by chapter examination of this thing. Jack Kirby's History of the Future. Now to start with the 12,000 year cycle of history. The trouble with history is there's a lot of it. Hundreds of thousands of years of people living and arguing and doing things. And most of it's lost, or so we are told. Let's take the Middle Ages, for example. We have a lot of physical evidence for this period, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa and Westminster Abbey. But just look at all those kings. And that's just one little corner of Europe. Who can remember all those names? And what about the 99.9% .9 of people who are not kings? Luckily, the common people have a much better way of remembering history. Here's Robin Hood. Simple story, easy to remember. Lives in the forest, robs the rich to feed the poor. They live in villages. Plus, we even remember the kings. King Henry and King Richard, who was always offered the Crusades. And King John with his high taxes. And so now we remember how the 99.9% .9 of people lived. Mythology is the best way to remember history. The stories are unforgettable. Like the story of Jesus, everybody remembers first century Palestine thanks to his story. Or the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's a brilliant way to remember a brief history of Babylon, Persia and Greece and so on. Or the ancient patriarchs. If you compare the dates to the history of Sumer, they all match up year for year. It's just an easy way to remember the civilization that gave us cities. In 4000 BC it began to expand. The lord of the city imported people from the countryside and said they could eat from the king's land in return for working the fields. We remember that story as Adam and Eve. This was a new economic system, bosses and workers. The city expanded. It created alliances with other cities. This led to more trade. This led to the invention of writing. It was the creation of mankind as we know it. The bosses made life worse and worse for the workers. The workers complained. Around the year 2350 BC, the rulers of the chief city of Sumer decided to smash the irrigation dams during the annual river flood. That flooded the city and all the surrounding fields. The whole world as far as the eye could see. This genocide broke the social contract. Workers no longer trusted bosses. Civilization collapsed. A warlord conquered all the cities of Sumer. His descendants built a great tower. They planned a new universal language for the empire. But again, the system collapsed. This led to migrations away from the old cities. Some of those migrants were the ancestors of the Jews. And so we can see that mythology gives us the history of civilization as we know it today. The civilization based on bosses and workers and endless growth. Ordinary people used to know these main events of our history. Something else we used to know is that this civilization would only last for 6,000 years. But how did we know? When the people migrated, their children married into nearby civilizations. Phoenicia, Egypt, Chaldea, which was basically Sumer, Greece, and the lands to the east. I just ignore the racist pictures. They all had records from before the age of bosses and workers, before 4000 BC. Most had records going back to 39,000 BC. 
The Egyptians say that our present cycle of civilization began around 9000 BC. The rise of bosses and workers was just the halfway point. The previous cycle began around 14,000 BC, then 28,000 BC, then 39,000 BC. The Indians say that a normal cycle is about 12,000 years. Obviously it might be cut short if some disaster happens, like the Younger Dryas event. Or other events might make it last a little longer. As we get closer to the end of a cycle, we get a better idea of how long it's going to last. It's just the same as a human living for 70 years. Your life might be cut short, or you might reach 70 and still have another 10 or 20 years in you. The exact reason for the 12,000 year cycle is hard to say, because most of the ancient records are lost. Whatever the underlying cycles are, the last thousand years is always a transition period. So our old traditions began to fall apart before the year 2000, and the next cycle starts around 3000. So that's probably enough about the 12,000 year cycle. There are more details in my book, of course. Now let's introduce Jack Kirby himself. Okay, who was Jack Kirby? Jack Kirby is known as the King of Comics. Um, because he created The Avengers, which became the world's most successful movie franchise. Um, officially, he co-created them. We'll get to that in a minute. He also inspired Star Wars. That's uh, the original Death Star there, which became the second most successful movie franchise of all time. You notice also uh, the writing on the wall there. This thing is just full of Jewish references. That's from the book of Daniel. Um, because... Kirby was Jewish, and that's very, very important to understanding him. That's a little Hanukkah card he sent out to somebody. And here is... I've got a picture of somewhere. There's a Kirby, I don't think you can see up there. No, that's not the one. That's Kirby smiling with his grandson, Jeremy. Uh, that's all I'm looking for. That's uh, Jack Kirby at Passover. Looking very <laughs> serious at somebody who's not taking Passover seriously. Now this is actually a really good book about Jack Kirby. It's by uh, his grandson Jeremy Kirby, A Personal Look. It has lots of nice photos of him. That's uh, Kirby before we went off to the war. That's his sweetheart, Roz. Now Roz, I mean they were a team. She ran the place. She did everything for him so that he could spend his entire time writing stories. I mean you cannot praise this woman enough. Amazing, amazing couple. It's wonderful. And yeah, one of the best things about this book is that it contains the entire text of The Frog Prince, which is a screenplay Kirby wrote. It's a good reminder that Jack Kirby was a writer. Though he happened to use art most of the time, he wrote with words and pictures, but he always saw himself as a writer. He often says, I don't want to be Rembrandt. You know, he's not looking to make the best pictures. He's looking to tell a story. That's what matters to him. And here's a rather wonderful uh, story he did about his childhood called Street Code, which is what it was like growing up in the, the very poor in the streets of New York. In the, well, he was born in 1917, uh, grew up in the Great Depression, what it was like fighting on the streets, you know, back when there were like, horses and carts on the streets of New York. Well, the last image, that's Kirby, really as a thinker, as a child. He said, I was hurting. I was hurting for Georgie and me, and for the lousy things we had to do for the street code. The street code meaning the rules of survival, what people do to survive. And he took that feeling into adulthood. Why are we like the way we are? And that's the Eternals. That's one that I'm going to focus on a lot. That's the story of mankind right from the beginning to about the year 2026. Um, this, I think, really sums it up more than anything else. Limitless dimensions, crossroads of infinity, the junction to everywhere. That really is his mind. Okay, I said how Kirby created the Avengers and all those other characters, but he was only officially credited as the co-creator. This is because his editor, Stan Lee, liked to fill in the word balloons and then call himself the writer. This is how it works. First, Kirby wrote a story like this. It's the menace of the Mega Men. You see, he left spaces where the word balloons should go, and then he wrote the notes in the margins. Down there, down there. Um, they're quite faint, so there's a printed copy above it. So this is a story as Kirby wrote it. It says, uh, a famous archaeologist, that's him, has dug up a statue of the twin god Janus. That's him. The Roman god of endings and new beginnings. The month January is named after Janus. A famous archaeologist has dug up a statue of twin god Janus, wants to verify its date with Reed Richards' equipment. That's Reed Richards, the great scientist. 
So that's the hook for the story. What is the ancient statue? How old is it? And where did it come from? And why is it so fierce? So we've got to turn the page to find out. Even the ancients pondered the problem that still plagues man today. So what is that ancient problem? Again, turn back. The ancient problem is the menace of the mega men and two faced people wanting to be mega. This radiation test will prove the date conclusively. The rays react. The intensity meter places a statue at 4000 BC. Now notice the word intensity meter. This is a real thing. That is a digital intensity meter. Uh, mentions light or other electromagnetic radiation. In the real world, you'd use a spectrum photometer, which is very similar, but looks like this. I'll find it on my laptop. One of those. But it does the same thing, it's just more complicated. <laughs> the spectrum photometer would be better for potassium argon dating, which is used for dating rock or clay. So Kirby shows a handheld device to make it clear what's happening. So this is good science. Now, you notice that date, 4000 BC. That's the start of bosses and workers. It's the Adam and Eve date. It's the start of mega men. The ancient Sumerians called them Lugols, which meant big men. Genesis calls them Nephilim, or fallen angels, that sometimes loosely translated as giants, the result of mixing men and gods. And the rest of the story has a Cain and Abel theme. According to Genesis 4, Cain was the one who invented cities, and hence the class system. So it's looking back to 4000 BC in the start of the class system, the start of mega men, and showing how it's still the same today. This is a huge real-world topic. This is the foundation of our civilization. This is the basis for pretty much all the problems we've ever had for the last 6,000 years. This is a big story. So we see how the storytelling pulls you forwards. We've got ancient gods, we've got an ancient theme that's highly relevant today. We've got real science, we've got real history. That is classic Kirby. That is why he was a great storyteller. Now let's see how the editor changed the story. Um, you see there, it says famous archaeologist has dug up the statue of Tungle, Stan Lee Border Note, where he says, Art dealer, why did Alicia do this strange statue? So immediately he's changed it, so he's an art dealer now, and not a famous archaeologist. And so that means the statue must be new. Now let's see the effect of these changes. The editor said that the archaeologist should now be an art dealer. And the statue, which was 6,000 years old, is now just a new statue created by the artist Alicia. So it completely removes the 6,000 years of history. It completely removes the whole point of a story about our ancient civilization. It also removes the science. He, if you remember, Kirby referred to this machine here as, a, uh, as an intensity meter, which is a genuine scientific instrument. The editor changes it to a uh, nano-digital nuclear scan. And instead of testing the age of the ancient artefact, which is the whole point of the story, because the artefact is now just a, a modern sculpture, he says, uh, I don't know what he does. I mean, he scans it for no particular reason. I think he's sort of remembering the story from scanning it or something. I and mean, he could remember the story anyway. And since the story now is all taking place in the past, then there's no urgency. He could go back to bed, they could chat for a while, there's no danger to anybody. So the danger is removed, the history is removed, the whole point of the story is removed, and the science is removed. You see this again and again. This isn't a particularly bad example. In my book, The Lost Jack Kirby Stories, I show how this is normal. In the 1960s, the danger, the science, the history, the whole point was removed for most of Jack Kirby's stories. Um, in the ideal with like the Fantastic Four, the Hulk, uh, the Avengers and so on. Uh, if you want more details about how Kirby's stories have changed, read this book, excellent book, According to Jack Kirby by Michael Hill. It goes into all the details. Okay, that's enough about that. Let's talk about Jack Kirby and the 12,000 year cycle of history. Now this is from an interview just before he died. He was talking about the Bible, how he believes in the Bible. But he also believes that there are civilizations before ours. And he said, we don't know how many civilizations there might have been on Earth before ours. My guess is there might have been 30, 40, 100. They might go back hundreds of thousands of years. Now let's look at Commandi, the book about the next civilization. He wrote a helpful essay to explain what he was talking about. He said, uh, does the Earth flip its lid every 10,000 years or thereabouts? 
Is planetary cataclysm part of some kind of continental adjustment the Earth must make in its endless swing around the Sun? Based on evidence gathered by authoritative representatives of our varied sciences, we could be due for another upheaval, the latest of a great cycle of upheavals, which, if it is speculated, our planet is prone to. It says, does the Earth flip its lid every 10,000 years or thereabouts? Uh, this is Jack Kirby's Secret, Cities, Secret City Saga. That's very hard to say. Uh, it's the last thing he did before he died. The other people had to finish it off, but he sort of did the basic ideas. Um, this is about the previous civilization in America 15,000 years ago. How the Earth changes between civilizations. But this part, I think, is very important. It really sums up what I'm trying to say here about previous civilizations. It'll make more sense when you read my book. Um, when the people from 15,000 years ago come back to this civilization, he says, uh, there, we've, we've made the surface, but of what planet and what time? Everything appears so different, so mechanical. My world was never like this, all man-made. My home was organic, alive. This is so cold, so dead. That really sums up what I'm trying to say with my book. The previous 12,000 year cycles, the world is full of life. Today we're covering the world with concrete. And it's ironic that we call the old times the Stone Age, where we're the ones covering the world with stone and were killing off all the other wildlife. They're the ones who had a world that was alive. OK, we've spoken about the 12,000-year cycle and introduced Jack Kirby. And now I've said a, a little bit about me. Um, I was raised as a Mormon. This is me as a Mormon missionary in Scotland in the 1980s. And I was pretty obsessed with the scriptures. Here's my old Bible before it fell apart. And that's a time chart I made of world history. Uh, very much like the very big one that's much smaller. It's got the regular stuff at the top, and it's got Mormon stuff at the bottom. So I was naturally interested in the prophecies, as you would be. Now the most famous prophecy is near the end of the book of Revelation. This is Revelation chapter 20. Uh, Satan bound for a thousand years. Um, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having hit key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And then when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loose out of his prison and shall go out to see the nations and blah, 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 a big battle. Chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, and so on. This is wonderful mythological language, but what does it mean that Satan is bound for a thousand years? The book of Revelation got the idea from the Parsees, that is, the Zoroastrians. Chiliasm, or the idea of the millennium, is older than the Christian church. For the belief in a period of 1,000 years at the end of time, as a preliminary to the resurrection of the dead, was held in Parsiism. So the idea that Satan is bound for a 1,000 years comes from the Zoroastrians, and it refers to the last 1,000 years of their 12,000-year model of history, which almost certainly comes from their older neighbours, the Hindus, with their 12,000-year cycle of history. Now, there's something weird about this prophecy. Why don't they just win? Why do they defeat Satan, but then he comes back a thousand years later? Why don't they just win? Here's the problem as a graph. They win, but then Satan suddenly reappears a thousand years later, and they have to win again. Why don't they just win? The problem's even clearer when we step back and include the whole Bible story. It's all up and down. Why don't they just win? Now, in the hero's journey, things are supposed to get worse and worse, but then you win. The 12,000-year cycle is the same. Things get worse and worse, and then you win. In fact, the 12,000-year cycle fits the Bible story very well. It also fits history very well. Now, Revelation said it would be different. But Revelation was wrong. But if you look at when Revelation was written, you can see why. Revelation was written after the destruction of Jerusalem when the Jews lost everything. All their hopes and dreams were destroyed. Now this is when Christianity became popular. Christianity is Judaism in denial. It says, we are not destroyed. We are not going to suffer under Babylon for a thousand years. We are going to destroy Babylon and win for a thousand years. But it didn't happen. The Christians just became Babylon. The 12,000 year cycle continued as it always has. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that before Revelation was written, the original prophecies agreed with the 12,000-year cycle. They knew they had a long way to go, and they knew the last thousand years would be bad, and they just had to accept it. 
Revelation draws on older prophecies which are not about Jesus. The old prophecy was that 6,000 years the world will exist and 1,000 years it will be desolate. Then after that it's a new heaven and a new earth. The Jews dated their calendar from when their ancestors were first brought into cities in Mesopotamia about 4000 BC. There are different ways of calculating this date and some people get different dates which is why you get different ending points. Some say it's 3761 BC. Either way, the 6,000 years is an approximation. And the ending is understood to be the Messianic era, which means when tyrants fall, the age of Logos begins. Logos just meant logic. And Messiah just meant people like the Emperor Cyrus or the Maccabee family, anybody who changes the world. The Jews thought of at least four different messiahs. Being desolate just means that there's a war between good and evil. So that's going to make the world desolate for a while. Now Christians change this. They change it to be one Messiah who was Jesus and he's going to descend out of the sky. Now that hasn't happened and so people think this isn't going to happen. But if you look at the original prophecy, it's happened pretty much as they described. Um, this is why I wrote my book about 1830 because one of the dates that was predicted 6,000 years after around 4,000 BC was maybe 1830 according to William Ward in, in the 1810s. He said it would be the greatest year in the history of the world and it actually happened. 1830 was the beginning of the age of revolutions in Europe. It's also the beginning of the age of machines. We had the first passenger railway. And railways changed the world. Michael Faraday was discovering electromagnetism in 1830. Babbage was building his first computer in 1830. Charles Darwin stepped off the HMS Beagle and began to think about the origin of species in 1830. Charles Lyell published the principles of geology about the age of the earth in 1830. So everything was changing. The world as we know it, where everything is different than it ever was before, began in 1830. That's why I became excited about the date. It also happened to be the date when my church began. And so I thought, I'm going to write a book about this. I went through all the Bible prophecies and I said, hey, look, they all predict 1830. All sort of charts and diagrams and things and notes and scriptures. But the more I looked at it, the more I realised I wasn't being honest. The Bible does not predict 1830. The Bible predicts sometime around 2000, give or take 100 years or so. Well, to cut a long story short, I left my church. I thought religion is too vague. I'll focus more on scientific experts. Who needs prophets when you have scientific predictions? I bought this book. It's published in 1982. Uh, it's just full of the best scientific predictions for the future. Take Isaac Asimov, for example, and here are his predictions. 1985, world oil production would fall below world needs. 1990, North America would no longer be a reliable source for food exports. 2000, under global sponsorship, the construction of solar power stations in orbit around the Earth will have begun. 2005, a mining station will be in operation on the Moon. 2010, world population will have peaked at something around 7 billion. 2015, the dismantling of the military machines of the world will have made international war impractical. 2020, the flow of energy from space stations will have begun. Nuclear fusion stations will be under construction. Yeah. He's no better than the religious predictors. And he's one of the best. All the experts are wrong. That got me thinking about the old prophecies again. They were written down 2,000 years ago, so being accurate to within 200 years is not bad. In fact, they claim to be written by Enoch 5,000 years ago. And I thought, well, what if we could get somebody who was like Enoch today, who understood all the ancient prophecies, and can see how they're getting fulfilled or not getting fulfilled, and maybe could be a little bit more precise. And that brings us to Jack Kirby. The rest of this video is me summarising the book, Jack Kirby's History of the Future. As you'll see, the cover is a homage to Commandy, issue one, The Last Boy on Earth, which is a very good outline of the start of the next civilization. There's a, another very nice spread there. The book is uh, 500 pages. It outlines Jack Kirby's history of the future. Jack Kirby wrote stories about the future and so far everything he predicted has come true. It outlines his predictions and shows how he follows the Jewish teaching that civilization will end around the year 2100 and that we will see a new heaven and new earth around the year 3000. 
Okay, it's really about 30 books compressed into one. There's uh, 16 chapters, 7 appendices. Appendix 2 has 7 sections. Every one of these sections is controversial. If I was going to persuade people that this was right, I'd need to spend 500 pages on each of these 30 sections. Now, if I did that, I'd never finish the book. So all I can hope for is that you'll at least understand what I'm saying. I know you'll disagree. I would. I would definitely disagree with what this person is saying. But hopefully once the things happen, if they do happen, as I think they're going to, in 2026, 2040 and so on, then maybe people will come back and have a look at the book and say, hmm, maybe he had a point. Okay, this is the basic concept. Whatever I have put down with pencil and paper has always come true. Maybe it has always been true. I don't deal in actual speculations, but I play with ideas like invisible building blocks. Now, here's a quick timeline. Basically, every 20,000 years or so, a human species goes extinct. And there's a summary of the predictions, if you don't get any further. The introduction is an example of a typical Jack Kirby prediction, and the rest of it is about messianic prophecy. And yeah, if you don't like messianic prophecy, then skip that part. Um, I know what you're thinking. I would think this if I was reading this book. I think this guy is off his head. He's crazy. I mean, Jack Kirby is an artist writer who wrote some stories. What on earth are you thinking? That this guy was some kind of a prophet? Well, I'm interpreting Kirby. Kirby, he encouraged us to interpret his work. Storytellers in ancient times did not have one version of the story that they were trying to force on you. It was a two-way communication. Kirby called his stories a conversation with the readers. And this is my conversation. Your conversation will be different. You might think I'm completely insane, and that's perfectly fine. The proof is whether these things actually happen, you know, in 2026, 2040, and so on. Chapter 1, who was Jack Kirby? Again, this could be a 500-page book on its own. Originally, I planned to have a biography, but that would have taken too long. All it comes down to is Jack Kirby was a human being. He really encaptures what it is to be a human being, and what it has been for the last 100,000 years. Okay, Chapter 2, which originally was, was Chapter 1. <laughs> Um, Kirby knew a lot of stuff. That's what it comes down to. Kirby knew a lot of things. And what I do is I go through one of his typical stories. There's 16 of these in the book. And I point out that they're absolutely packed full of art. Uh, well, here, references, popular culture, literary tropes. This is why I love Kirby stuff. You can go back and read it again and again and again. You'll always find something new. Really, a whole book could be written on every one of Kirby's five-page stories. The rest of the chapter is just an overview of just how much Kirby knew and how he knew it. He had extremely broad general knowledge, terrific political insight, his love of the classics, and how he really lived the classics, how everything he did was based on experience, deep understanding of stories from around the world, science obviously, how he'd predict things before they happened, life, this is going to be a big part of the book. You might think the rest of the book is garbage, maybe it is. But I would encourage you to look at chapter 15 on life. That's where I take some of Kirby's ideas, push them as far as I can go, and argue from first principles what life actually is. Uh, socioeconomics. History. Kirby knew a huge amount of history. In this book, I make big claims about information encoded in Kirby's stories. Kirby did not intend this stuff, but he was adapting mythology from thousands of years ago. So without realising it, he was passing on information from thousands of years ago. In chapter 3, I argue that Kirby wasn't eternal. That is, somebody who remembers the ancient past. Um, I also argue that Kirby, as you know, his real name was uh, Jacob Kurtzberg, is very much like the original Jacob. In that he fights with angels, he fights with gods. He's not religious in a modern sense, where you obey gods. In the ancient sense, you fight the gods. The rest of this chapter is Kirby's first full-length story, and I just comment on each page. Because my argument is that storytellers are the most valuable people we have. Stories preserve values, they preserve history, they are the culture of the tribe, they are the things that will help us to survive. And so I go through ten eternal laws which we can derive from a story like the Diary of Dr. Hayward. Sociology is the most important science. This is a big one later on, because we think of ourselves as being scientifically advanced. But in the sciences that matter, we've gone backwards. We are very, very primitive. Um, killers pretend to be friends. That's a big one. I, I get a little bit political there. Moving forward, <laughs> it's easy to be fooled. All these 
eternal laws. If we learn these things, we survive as a civilization. And our civilization, I think, is forgetting these things. I think people opposing nature, uh, wanting to be gods. A lot of Kirby's work was about gods. There are two ways to look at Kirby's gods. There is the god, i.e. connections, basically logic, the universe, that which connects us all. And then you have people trying to be like that. I am a priest, I am a king, I, I am inspired, I have something special inside me. So lots of people use technology for war. These should be very banal, very mundane, very ordinary ideas, and yet we forget them. Our modern world is built on the idea that technology is good. No, technology is a tool. If you don't get the sociology right, you're just giving tools to tyrants. Uh, walls. Originally, um, an earlier version of this book had a much bigger section on walls, on the wall of Jericho, 8000 BC. The biggest man-made structure in the world for 5,000 years. As Kirby said, we have a fetish for putting up walls. We are a civilization of walls. Walls are so common and ordinary to us, we think it's normal. Uh, but our stories make us think. This story seems pretty straightforward. There's a good guy and a bad guy. But when you look closer at it, things aren't what they seem. Kirby was great for this. You read the story the fourth or fifth time and like, wait a minute, the guy I thought was the hero is actually the villain. Now we get to the meat of the book, lost civilizations, and what it is to be civilized. Kirby believed that there could have been 30 or 40 or 100 civilizations before ours, each lasting around 10,000 years. So we need to look at what it means to be civilized. The Bible talks about the Garden of Eden. The Egyptians spoke of the age of the gods. The Greeks called it the Golden Age. Now this didn't mean that people were better back then, but it meant specifically that people didn't have to work for a living. So there was no power structure, there's no boss. Kirby has an excellent story about that, a demon wind. It's about the modern remnants of the golden age and how these people lived, about the more advanced science, or sociologically more advanced, about how they were more peaceful. We have this theory that ancient people were very warlike, but the data does not support that. Their legal system, their economic system, the food, lifespan, how long people lived back then, um, then let's start to look at civilization before 8000 BC, when we built the Wall of Jericho. We've used the same 32 symbols for the last 62,000 years. I look at writing, I look at journeys by sea, I look at ancient signposts, all before 8000 BC. I look at maps and calendars, and how the Golden Age ended. How we rebranded the Golden Age and began to call it the Stone Age. Because the Golden Age was a great threat. When people started to visit these remote islands and saw that life was actually better than it was in Europe, they began to realise that 10,000 years of progress had actually made our lives worse. We often think of civilization as being the same as a city, but know that the Greek word is different. That's polis. The word for civilization, the word civis, is to do with the community. And it appears that civilization was better before we had cities. And then in chapter 5, I look at the ancient historians. How did people record history before we had full writing? I mean, here's one example, uh, string figures. This is another example of a story where the second or third time you read it, you begin to wonder who is actually the hero and who is the villain. In this chapter, I go back through Kirby's stories of ancient history, how the story of Camelot was based on the story of Camelot, about the fall of Europe's first cities, about the Kirby story of Prometheus. And going back further to Noah's flood, Kirby wrote about Noah's Ark, and uh, how... If you look at the dates in the Bible, they actually match up with the dates in ancient Sumer. Uh, there's a lot more about this in the appendix. About the fall of paradise, Adam and Eve, 4000 BC. About how it matches up with history. About the Atlantis War. I've got a, quite a large appendix on that subject. Now, Atlantis was the beginning of our 12,000 year cycle. Going further back, there's the pre-Clovis civilization in Kirby's Secret City Saga. Going further back, We've got the first gods before 28,000 BC, about the god that we call Vulcan. He appears in Kirby's story, Mercury in the 20th century. Now this part's important, Manetho's timeline, I refer to this a lot. Manetho was the great Egyptian historian. 50,000 BC was Kirby's favourite date. He goes back to it again and again. It's in Tuck, it's in Captain 3D, it's in Lightning the Lone Rider. 50,000 BC, that's what we call the Upper Paleolithic. That's when humans became behaviourally modern. That's when we became us. There's the Toba eruption, 73,000 BC, which is caught quite nicely with the Eternals, issue two. And there's Kirby's story of the Great Dying and Marek, set in 200,000 BC. 
all these stories match up with real history. What does all this history mean? It means that power is bad. Kirby referred to the power people, also known as the mega men, the big men, the people who think they're better than other people. He said they are the cause of all our problems. And what Kirby wanted was an end to power. Here's a story about power. Kirby grew up in the gangster era. And he saw how it hurt innocent people. Kirby's work always has the constant theme of compassion. He understands that the central problem of history is power versus life. I mentioned how Kirby created the Avengers and how he inspired Star Wars. This chapter has the details. Kirby spent his life warning against power. His most famous stories are about superheroes. He designed them as warnings against superpower, because with a superpower, nobody wins. Now, this might come as a surprise to Kirby fans, so I show in this chapter how all his superheroes were designed as warnings against power, but they were always turned around by the publishers but to become pro-power. Uh, it's a story about a superhero and uh, how power was dangerous and what you do about it. About how superpowers are real. About how power corrupts. How his warnings are reversed. But people like to be superheroes. They like to have power. They like to believe that power is sexy and desirable and people with power are good people and that power does not corrupt. And about how Kirby inspired Star Wars. So many parallels. I think this picture says it all. And now we finally get to the first prediction. And about time too, I can hear you say. 1976. This is a big year for Kirby. He spent the whole year warning against power. And he argued that in 1976, that's when the space gods will return. The space gods were people modelled on the old Inca and Aztec rulers, who, were, who claimed divine power and owned everything. People like Atahualpa or Quetzalcoatl, who promised to come back and do again what they used to do, where one person owned everything and everybody else was nothing compared with them. And they claimed their authority from the sky. Um, the, typically they'd build big towers to claim to be closer to the heavens. Now today, our space gods, our multi-billionaires, are the same. They absorb all money to themselves and they fly in the sky, and that is the proof that they are cleverer than us, you know, they can build spaceships. We'll look at this argument later on, whether these people really are better. But this is the key concept of the Eternals, which is the history of mankind. And Kirby was warning that this is how civilization ends. I've got Blue Bolt as an example of a, of a space god. He wasn't created by Kirby. Kirby inherited the character. It was a typical power fantasy. Let's have a character with all power. Wouldn't it be great to be him? Um, whereas Kirby shows, well, Kirby gradually changed the story to show the dangers of power. He also predicted the uh, atom bomb in this story five years before it uh, before it became real. Kirby showed how this must inevitably lead to the destruction of the world. In this chapter, I show why 1976 was important: the, the rise of the the tech billionaires, um, how the world changed in 1976. Then, chapter nine: future trends. Uh, in the book OMAC, remember at the beginning I uh, said I showed that picture, the world that's coming, that is OMAC, One Man Army Corps. Every issue was some theme about the future world. Uh, the first theme is that we are killing the planet. Kirby described modern business as God Corp, with the motto, grab it all, own it all, drain it all, and that this is what we do to the world. He described it in his books, New York 2040 AD, OMAC. Toxol, the world killer, the face on Mars, Commandy, new gods. They're all about our natural desire to kill and destroy. So this is the biggest thing we should watch out for. The second trend is that ordinary people then become powerless. That's very much the case in OMAC. Third trend is that the super wealthy are above the law. Um, trend four is fake reality. Trend five is when people become replaceable. Uh, trend six, smart atomic weapons. Wars become safe for the elites. This will be very important later. Um, people who are desperately poor will do anything just to survive. The oceans are drained of resources and China and America in conflict. Uh, then chapter 10. This is probably the part you're waiting for. Here is the actual timeline of the future starting 1940. 1940 was his first prediction. It wasn't actually a dated one. That was about the, uh, the nuclear weapons. Now the important thing to know here is how mythology works. This is a story about an alien spaceship appearing and presenting people with an ultimatum. 
It is clearly based on the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. We need to recognise that, although it's about a robot, it's also about the Cold War, particularly the Cold War in space, because they come from outer space. Once we understand that, then we can see the real-world elements of a story like The Emissary, how enemies finally become friends. It says it takes place in July 1975, and that's exactly what happened in July 1975, more than two decades after the story was written. The next prediction is the anti-nuclear war movement. The next prediction is the moon landing, a failed Mars landing, um, getting rid of old Russian leaders, a fictional superweapon, terrorist bombs in Paris, the first exoplanet, the end of the Cold War, people living in electronic bubbles, distrust of big science. All these things were predicted. All these things actually happened. And finally, we come to 2026. Jack Kirby's Eternals gives us the history of the world. It says the space gods will arrive in 1976, they'll watch the world for 50 years, and then, i.e. in 2026, they will decide if the world lives or dies. Now, the space gods, historically, have been people like Atahualpa, Quetzalcoatl, or today, people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. People with enormous power, power that grows every day, so that everybody else becomes very insignificant. Even now, if you want something done from a government, you've got to be rich. There are still a few loopholes, but those loopholes will be closed by 2026. By 2026, you'll have a choice of two parties, either the party of the rich or the party of the rich. Now, at first, this might seem like a great thing, because these people provide everything we want. Now, Kirby had a story about this. What if you have somebody who's got tremendous power and just gives you everything you want? Isn't that a good thing? Well, no, it's not a good thing, because that is not nature's way. If somebody has all power, and one day they decide it's in their interest to kill you, then they will kill you. They might decide to feed you now, they might decide to kill you tomorrow. That's what power does. We think, well, they'll never do that to us, of course they won't. Well, another thing that happens in 2026 is, this is when we are due to reach 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels of global warming. Now this was a big milestone that we promised we would never exceed in the 2016 Paris Accord. But we did it anyway. And why? Because it makes money. It makes money to allow global warming, even though it kills millions of people. So in 2026 we will have our proof that people with power will kill millions of people if it makes them money. So the question is, will it make them money to kill us? Hmm. We'll look at that in a later chapter. Chapter 12 is 2026 to 5000. Now we continue the timeline of the future. That's a, a kind of commandy story which uh, Kirby wrote in the 1950s. A lot of people think that Commandy was copying Planet of the Apes. And certainly, that's why the publisher was happy for him to publish that. But all the major elements of Commandy were already in The Last Enemy in the 1950s. Right, 2040, that's when we should have private space travel. As far as I can see, we are well on track for that. 2050 is when the future starts to look very bad. You ask young people today, I think you'll say we're on track for that. 2065 is when machines start to replace skilled humans. They already replace unskilled humans to a large extent. 2065 is when people start to realise that nobody's job is safe. 2072 is when global warming leads to conflict with China. 2088 is when we realise we have one last chance, but it starts to look very, very bad. 2089 is when we have rival spaceships. It's not just Elon Musk anymore. 2090 is the first successful humanoid robot. And that is when ordinary humans realise they are obsolete. They are no longer profitable. 2095 is when anybody with any sense realises that Earth is history. 2021 is the Great Disaster, the event described in Commandy. Now, Kirby doesn't specifically say 2021, but you put a lot of clues together. That's the, by far the most uh, likely date. Uh, I deal with some of the changes described there. Um, what he means by talking animals. Um, 2140, the Mars colony has to survive on its own because Earth has collapsed. 2150, the super-rich have given up on Earth. 2165 and possibly 2190 is when 
the surviving people are reassuring their children that everything's okay, really, everything's safe, really, when really it isn't. The 2260 is when law and order returns on planet Earth. 2262, when nuclear weapons have long since been banned. 2306, first trip to Mars since the Great Disaster. 2389, we're still not using faster than light travel. The curve is very realistic. 2500 is when we explore other worlds. 2514, a major atomic war, happens long before this date. That's the one that was referenced in um, The Last Enemy. All he says is that there was a major atomic war at some point. It might be the one in 2121, there might be another one, we don't know. 2540 is when comics are mainstream ancient mythology. People will see Captain America and Spider-Man the same way that we see Robin Hood today. 2957, Earth and Mars are at war. 33,000, finally a golden age of peace, probably. 3,000 is also known as, the, known as the greatest age of technology and peace. 3,000 is a very popular date for Kirby. It's also when we adapt our bodies for star travel. And 3,045 is when most people leave for new planets. 3,048, those left behind just want to have fun. 3,500 is when war returns. 3994 is a dying world. 4000 is also a dying world. 5000 is when Earth dies and is reborn. 5000 is when new humans are smaller. Bonus uh, prediction there, 6 million or earlier, it's difficult to say, depends on how you interpret it, is the sixth age of mankind, when humans look rather different. And now we come to the road to Armageddon. How we reached the nuclear war of 2121 and why it was inevitable for the last 10,000 years. Um, this is really summed up by the wonderful Cadmus Seed story. This is really an overview of the last 10,000 years in terms of cause and effect. What the Greeks described as the origins of strife. There are two kinds of strife, there's war and there's work. And they have an overview of the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, the Heroic Age and the Iron Age. This 10,000 year drive towards nuclear war is summed up by Cadmus, the first Greek hero, the symbol of science and progress and regret, because it all goes horribly wrong. I then talk about Kirby's stories and how they can all be seen as uh, stories about the road to nuclear war. Uh, so Silver Star is the obvious one. In my book, The Lost Jack Kirby Stories, I talk about how the whole Thor epic is the road to Ragnarok as the road to nuclear war, then why it's inevitable. What it comes down to is economics. At the moment, 91,000 people, that's the, the top 0.001%, own 33% of global wealth. The next 0.14% of people, that's 8.4 million people, own 51% of global wealth. And there's the rest of us, the bottom 99.9%, .9 own 16% of global wealth. But at the moment, they need us to do the work. So we have to buy stuff, we have to go to work and so on. However, as machines improve, the numbers change. We become less and less important. And they don't need us anymore. They do need the next 0.14% because they will still need engineers. We're not going to have human level robots till 2090. And even then there'll be some specialisms that for some reason only humans can do. They'll need a few million people to run everything. But the rest of us will be dead weight. I live in Scotland. We had a similar experience here in the 1700s and early 1800s. If you drive around Scotland, you'll find a lot of old ruined houses because there came a time when the rich people realised that sheep were more profitable than humans. So they just got rid of the humans. Jeff Bezos explained it. He said, I've always wanted to turn the earth into a sort of national park. They will be born in these colonies, live in these colonies, they may visit Earth the way you would visit Yellowstone National Park. So that is the goal, to turn the Earth into a national park. Of course, economics mean the cost of visiting here will only be affordable to the super-rich. Everyone else will live on private space stations, where whether you get oxygen depends on whether you work hard. And most people will simply not be needed. I mentioned to my daughter that we might be heading for a nuclear war in 2121, and uh, she said, that's a bit depressing. And I thought, she's got a point. So I added another three chapters to the book. Chapter 14 is, what can we do about it? I've argued so far that we live in a very unscientific age, in that we've rejected the science that matters. 
the science of sociology. Instead, we've just created tools for monsters. And here I argue that there's, there's another area in which we are very unscientific. We have a very unscientific view of ourselves. Now, long-time readers of Jack Kirby may have noticed something rather unusual about his writing. None of his characters have an inner life. Everything they see and everything they think is the same thing you could see or think from the outside. They examine the problems and they solve problems. They don't pretend that they have some person inside them, some deep, complex mind, whereas other writers do. So I look at the science of the inner self. Now, Kirby's view is very, very ancient. The idea that we have an inner self was invented about 550 BC. Now, kings had a kind of an idea before that, but they just pretended they were connected to the gods. The idea that each of us individually is something special inside was invented about 550 BC. And there's absolutely no scientific evidence for it. It's utter nonsense. It just turns us against each other and makes us unhappy. Um, all right, I look at the claim that some people are just special. I got the claim of Einstein and uh, Elon Musk. Where did their power and abilities come from? Well, the evidence suggests it's luck, basically. Now, this is a picture of Moses that uh, Kirby had on his wall, where it sort of follows you around the room. If, if you remember the story of Moses, his concept was, let my people go. He saw what it was like to be a slave to Pharaoh, so he created a promised land where there was no Pharaoh and no king. Now, the system he proposed in the Bible has since been shown to be the most efficient economic system possible. If we'd actually followed what Moses said in, say, 600 BC, when the, the Bible as we know it was, was published, then each of us today would be making 10 billion trillion dollars every day. But we're not making that much money because we didn't follow his economic system. Enough with the doom and gloom. Let's have some good news. In chapter 15, I look at our personal futures. Life after death. This is where the book starts to get weird. In Kirby's stories, pretty much anything can be conscious. And human consciousness is defined by brain waves. So I thought I'd look into this. It turns out that the brain changes 40 times per second. And if you measure what it is the brain actually does, the conscious mind only handles one bit of data every 40th of a second. In other words, everything the conscious mind experiences is one bit of data at a time. Now, the minimum possible data at any point in space is vastly more complicated than that, because every point in space is defined by numerous fields, electromagnetism, uh, Higgs field, and so on. So there is vastly more complexity in a point of space than there is in the human mind. And since no man can serve two masters, there has to be one point at which every decision is made. It all follows that human consciousness must be a point in space. Therefore, it cannot be destroyed. It can only change. So when we die, we simply change our experience. And in the next chapter, I look at what that experience is like. I argue that when you look closely at any part of life, it's fractally complicated. Ants, for example, have an extremely complex and interesting life. It's different from our life, but it's just as complicated, just as interesting, just as varied. The same is true of subatomic scales. Whichever scale you look at, life is just as interesting, just as complicated, just as fascinating as the human scale. The main difference is that with a smaller brain or no brain at all, we have fewer or no problems because the brain is a machine designed to feed problems to the mind. The brain is trying to model the entire universe and trying to guess what will happen in a minute's time and an hour's time and a day's time because the brain is such a complicated and unnatural device. Simply existing is a problem. Most of the universe doesn't have that problem. Most of the universe just goes with the flow. Without a human brain, we don't have the problems, but we do have the experience. We do have the friends, we do have the relationships, we do have the knowledge, we do have the awareness. If anything, we have far more awareness because a point in space is connected to every other point in space. So I finished my book with a quote by Kirby. You'll find out that my characters never die. It's my ode to humanity itself. We never really die. Now we come to my favourite part of the book. Up until now, I've made a lot of big claims. This is where I back them up. Right, the first claim was that people can see the future to the precise year 
even hundreds of years in advance. Why? Because they understood the cycles of history. Otto von Bismarck, he understood war. He understood in 1898 that there would be a war 20 years later. And he was right. Ferdinand Foch, the Supreme Allied Commander in World War I, in 1919, he again understood there's going to be another big war 20 years later. And he was right. Even the children can tell. In this cartoon from 1919 is a child who knows he'll be a soldier in 1940. Another example is Theodor Herzl. In 1897, he predicted the founding of the Jewish state within 50 years. John Brunner, science fiction writer. In 1968, he wrote a book called Stand on Zanzibar about the year 2010. It was remarkably good. The Book of Enoch. I mentioned the Book of Enoch a lot. Here's more details about its predictions for Armageddon before the year 2239. Now, this date, you'll remember, is 6,000 years after the fall of Adam. Now, the Jewish date for that is 5761 BC, which was calculated using the shortest possible assumptions. So the probable date is before that. Uh, more about the 12,000 year cycle. Um, why 12,000 years? Then the Daniel's AD 37 prophecy. This is probably the clearest and most impressive prophecy in the Bible. But most people miss it. They either want to believe that Jesus was not a Messiah, or they want to believe that he succeeded. What actually happens is he failed, but he still fulfilled the prophecy. Uh, Isaac Newton, very, very clever man. You may have heard of him. He calculated, based on the prophecies, that the end of the world must be sometime not before 2060 and not after 2344. Handsome Lake, who was the great prophet of the Seneca people, he reckoned around about the year 2100. He called it the fourth world. Interesting, that's a phrase that Kirby Definitely. used. And now for the big one, Appendix 2, How Scholars Destroy History. Throughout this book, I've argued that storytellers preserve history, scholars destroy history. Obviously, kings destroy far more history, but scholars are the ones who enable it. Um, here are seven examples of how scholars have destroyed far more history than they've ever preserved. Uh, example one is destroying 2,000 years of Hebrew records. You may have heard of the documentary hypothesis, the idea that there are multiple source documents for Genesis, and that we can work out what they are. And our scholars have been doing this for hundreds of years. Then, very embarrassingly, the original source documents were discovered. And it turns out they were completely different from what the scholars said, and they backed up what Genesis said. But instead of following the real documents, the scholars continued to follow their imaginary documents. It, it's an absolute fiasco. The second example is destroying 10,000 years of American records. There are many examples to show that oral history of the Native Americans goes back 10,000 years, but it makes the European invaders look very bad. So the invaders kill as many Indians as they can. They displace the rest of them so that they're no longer on their lands, which makes it very hard to remember the oral history, because most of the history is tied to particular places. These rivers and valleys become memory aids. You remove the Indians from their homes, and it's much harder to remember all the details. And then they re-educate the children and force them to learn modern history and forget their own past, and so on and so on. And the scholars not only support it, but they make it very difficult for the Indians to get ahead in the universities. In theory they do, but in practice they're very, very limited in what the natives can do. Example three is destroying 10,000 years of Phoenician records. Our oldest and greatest historian was Sankuniathan, the Phoenician. He lived around 2000 BC, and he realised that the oldest records in his day were being forgotten. Because back then, the oldest records were written on pillars, such as at Gebekli Tepe. And you needed a great deal of training to understand what these symbols meant, and people were beginning to forget. So Sankuniathan went around all the ancient pillars, trying to work out what they originally meant. His records were then saved on the Canaanite pillars. But if you read the books of Kings and Chronicles in the Old Testament, the high priest Hilkiah and the young king Josiah, they were the greatest scholars of their day, went around systematically destroying these pillars. Example 4, destroying 110,000 years of Yazidi records. Uh, in Appendix 3, I talk about the Yazidi records and how they go back 110,000 years. Uh, modern scholars just dismiss them as being forgeries. Even though there's no evidence for them being forgeries, and the records appear to be confirmed by archaeology. 
Example 5, destroying 9,000 years of Atlantean records. That's going to be the focus of Appendix 4. I just give one example here. Most scholars will say that it was never intended to be taken seriously. So they say that Aristotle, who was Plato's famous uh, disciple, did not take Atlantis seriously. But that is complete garbage. Uh, Torvald Frank has gone into great details to examine where this came from. It could all be traced to a mistake by a French scholar in around the year 1800. But because it suits what scholars want to believe today, they'll still quote this as a fact when all the evidence shows that Aristotle, like everybody else, knew that Atlantis was a real place. Example 6 is destroying 1,000 years of future history. Now this is an interesting one. I've argued that storytellers are our best guide to history and that they see the patterns in history. And so storytellers are also a very good guide to the future. Now in terms of the future, if you read what the best storytellers say, that is the one to have the best understanding of the past, they all agree on what's going to happen in the future. First, they're going to have more technology. Second, we'll have inequality. Then there'll be a nuclear war. Then a post-apocalyptic period. And then we'll have more equality for a while. That's an outline of the future that all the best storytellers agree on. However, there, is, there are some storytellers who say, no, 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 the future is going to be wonderful. Technology is fine. We're all going to be happy. And we will solve our problems and live in a technological utopia. The poster child for this is Star Trek, specifically Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. And here I show how Gene Roddenberry did not create Star Trek. These are the documents for how Ib Melchior created Star Trek. Now, Ib Melchior was well versed in history. So like every other great writer, he understood that the future would have problems and we will go through cycles, and that they will not have a techno-utopia future. But Roddenberry was not well informed about history. So when he took it over, he thought, oh no, everything will be fine. Scholars then come along and say, well, Roddenberry must have created it because all the fans say that Roddenberry created it. They then give Gene Roddenberry the, the seal of approval. And so we have scholars then saying that, that great writers disagree over the future. No, great writers do not disagree over the future. They might disagree over details, but the great writers have a very consistent view of the future. We know the future. But because the scholars have given credibility to people who are not great writers, then it muddles the future and suddenly we don't know anymore. Destroying 2,000 years of Western civilization. As we discussed before, civilization comes from the word civis, meaning the community. Now, Jesus had a plan for civilizing the Western world. That is, showing the Western world how to live as a community. Now, the last 2,000 years has been a story of people following Jesus, trying to get the Western world to be civilized, to live as a community, and other people trying to get them to live as slaves under a hierarchy of power. It's a straightforward story. Civilization versus power. However, the scholars then say, no, 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 we don't know what Jesus taught. We really can't say anything about it. It's all a mystery. It's all confusing. We don't know what's happened. Scholars are destroying the very simple story of 2,000 years trying to civilize the West. So here I look into how the scholars have destroyed the story of Jesus. Now, it started, of course, as soon as Jesus died. People then tried to get power based on being connected with him. So I'm not saying the scholars invented this by any means. I use the example of Mark because Mark is the earliest gospel. I'm arguing that Mark is a reliable historical text written in AD 42, based on events from AD 37, where notes were written at the time. Appendix 3, the last great disaster. When Kirby described the great disaster of 2121, he seems to be describing the Le Champ event, where the magnetic poles almost reversed around 39,000 BC. At the very least, this will have caused the northern lights to be seen as far south as the Mediterranean and towards the equator. People relied on the sky to tell them the calendar, both short term and long term. The sky gave you the, the patterns and the cycles by which all the world runs. So when you see lights in the sky in the north, and you've never seen them before, this was highly significant. That was the time when Homo sapiens moved north to take over the lands of the Neanderthals. And all the major civilizations date their history to that date, 39,000 BC. I find it remarkable that people aren't talking about this. That, you know, I look at Egypt in 39,000 BC, China in 39,000 BC, India in 39,000 BC, the Jews in 39,000 BC, the Mesopotamians in 39,000 BC. They seem to have records going right back to 110,000 BC. 
and have a section on Kirby's various lost civilizations, and showing how his stories, although of course they're fictionalized and dramatized, he tries to make them as entertaining as possible, they all describe technologies which are kind of like the real technologies we really had 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 years ago. And now everybody's favorite appendix, Atlantis. This is where I show that there are at least four different accounts of Atlantis that predate Plato. If we focus on those accounts of Atlantis, the older ones, then we get a much better idea of where it was, what happened, and so on. Atlantis was never lost. Everybody knew where the lands of Atlas were, or the Sea of Atlas. Um, when it said island, it just meant over water. The island of Mero, for example, we would not call that an island today. That was the capital of Nubia, the great rival of Egypt. But because they had to cross a river to get there, they called it an island. Similarly, they used to call the continents islands because they had rivers separating them. Now, you could walk around these rivers over land if you wanted to. You could get from Asia to Libya um, without crossing the, the Nile. You could get from Asia to Europe without crossing the Phasos if you wanted to. But in practice, you would cross those rivers. Because you cross water, they are called islands. So when we're looking for the island of Atlantis, we're just looking for somewhere where you cross a river or cross water to get there. Um, the Atlantic Seas. This is not the Atlantic Ocean. Ocean was a very different word. Plato called it the Atlantic Seas, or in other words, the Seas of Atlas. These are the inland seas that used to be in Tunisia. They're much, much smaller today. But the Sahara used to be a lot wetter. Uh, I covered the Pillars of Heracles. There are Pillars of Heracles at all the edges of the, the Greek world. Now, the Greek world at the time was the Eastern Mediterranean. So the Western Pillars were between Carthage and Sicily. If there was any doubt, you can check the, the book On the Cosmos by Plato's student Aristotle, in which he states that the Pillars of Heracles were just around here, which is, of course, where the Sea of Atlas is. Here I show this is always the natural boundary. Around about the time of Atlantis, about 8000 BC, sea levels or lower, archaeologists have found a monolith there which marked the boundary between the eastern Mediterranean and the west. This was just a natural place for any boundary mar marker such as the uh, Pillars of Heracles. The pillar, word pillars was a stella, it means a stone with writing on. But as the Greeks expanded their lands, they moved west and so their idea of the western pillars started here, then moved to here, and then moved further over here. Um, I show how the location of Atlantis was never a mystery. Just, just read Herodotus, he makes it very clear. We're talking of the Atlas Mountains and the Sea of Atlas here. Um, some of the accounts of Atlantis that predate Plato. Now, scholars will say they aren't really accounts of Atlantis, they're talking about the daughter of Atlas, but the daughter of Atlas is Atlantis, it's the same word. For example, Israel is a land, but it's also a people, it's also an individual. Because they would have their original ancestor, the man Israel, who would then have descendants called the people of Israel, and wherever they lived was the land of Israel. So when we talk about the daughter of Atlas, we're automatically talking about her followers and the land they lived in. Um, here we're talking about how the, an earthquake caused the flood, the exact location of, of Atlantis. Now, a funny thing, um, Star Wars, the original movie, it begins at the Lars family homestead, which was filmed just here, within the boundaries of Atlantis. Uh, the Atlantis War and Archaeology. People tend to think of Egypt as beginning 3000 BC. That's just when one king became king over the whole region. But it was the same people and the same lands right back to 9000 BC and before. Uh, the origin of Athens is just as they spoke about in the story of Atlantis. Now Plato said that you could read the story of Atlantis on the walls of the Egyptian temples. And you can. And here I show where it is. It's all about the people of the cow. Once you understand who the people of the cow are, then it all falls into place. Even Athens remembered the Atlantis War. Remember, Atlantis just means the daughter of Atlas. So if you're talking about a war against the people of Atlas, well, there's a very, very famous war against the, against the people of Atlas. When you look at the details, it all matches what Plato spoke about in the, the Atlantis War. Uh, another account of the Atlantis War is in Hesiod's Theogony. Uh, he calls them the Gorgons. It was defeating the Gorgons is what gave Athens its power, or defeating the Atlanteans, in other words, just as Plato said. Plato was very precise about the measurements. To cut a long story short, during the wet Sahara period, there was a river, a very large river, the Tamanrasset, which ran from the Atlas Mountains right down to what they called the Karagoli, which means the spiral structure. And this appears on all the ancient maps, the Karagoli. In fact, the maps seem to be written, drawn as if they are intended as a map of how to get there. You go down to the islands, 
you follow the mountains inland, you get to the Caragoli. And when you get there, you find the Hippodrome, which is the, the racetrack and the, the chariots of the gods. There's some kind of ancient tradition of ancient chariots being at this great circular land feature. The area is full of rock art showing chariots. So when Plato describes this as a great chariot race, he didn't make it up. It's the Caragoli, the spiral structure that we call the, the Rickat structure, was a natural fortress. So every five or 10,000 years, when the Sahara was wet, when it was full of people, this would be the natural place they would gather, be connected to the sea via the feeder rivers, the Taman Rasset, in this area. And then every five or 10,000 years, it would dry up again. So this would become a legendary fortress. So it was no surprise that come 9,000 BC, when people started to build cities, when the people of Atlantis built their city up here, they modeled it on the ancient natural fortress down here. And then talk about uh, how the end of Atlantis may have caused the late Bronze Age collapse, other ancient civilizations that sank, and how the storytellers combine them all. Because the details aren't, don't really matter. 9000 BC, 8000 BC, whether it's the Rickat structure or whether it's on the moon, doesn't really matter. What matters is that the place was real. The war caused the beginning of our current 12,000 year civilization. And that cities do sink and they do flood. I mean, Kamandi is about that. Global warming is going to flood our cities. We need to understand these cycles of nature. It doesn't matter that we might mix up different floods. The fact is these things happened and they begin and end our civilizations. Appendix 5 is about Genesis. Is Genesis history? Kirby thought it was. And here I cover concepts like God and evolution, uh, the seven day training course. A lot of people seem to think that uh, the seven days of Genesis 1 are the days in which the things happened. Whereas if you look at the source material, it appears to be seven days in which you were taught these things. And these are highly relevant. The things they teach in the Enuma Elish and other ancient documents are very relevant today. These are very smart people. I look at Sankunyathan's version of Genesis. Uh, then Genesis 2, the Golden Age, about uh, the location of Eden. Why is it not obvious to people? Genesis tells you where Eden is said it's at the source of the Gion, the Tigris, the Pishon and the Euphrates, which means it has to be the Lake Ermia Basin. And sure enough, the river runs out of Eden, and from the Lake Ermia Basin, the four great rivers spread out. It's not a mystery. Uh, Genesis 4 is the Bronze Age. Cain, of course, just means metal smiths. Everything in Genesis is describing what actually happened. Genesis 5 is the really interesting one, because here you get the dates of the major events in Sumer. Groups of people are treated as if they are individuals. We see this all the time. For example, uh, Israel, the person, is also Israel, the group, the descendants of Israel. These are the names they gave to the eras in Sumer, and the dates in Genesis all match up. Then at the end I include the Tower of Babel, because uh, when Sumer fell, then Akkad took over, but then Akkad fell. Appendix 6 is about Moses. Moses gets a bad rap. Moses is probably the most important person of the last 6,000 years, possibly the last 12,000. So I show how kings changed the story of Moses. The important thing to remember is if you look at what Moses taught, it was rejected by the kings of Israel. Look at the origins of Yahweh, how Moses was a polytheist, evidence that Moses was real, the Egyptian accounts. Once again, if you look at the older accounts, then you get a much better idea of what it is that the Bible is saying. If you read the Baal cycle and see what it's actually saying, this is the, the cycle of stories from Canaan. Now, Canaan is where Israel lived. So these are the original teachings of the Israelites before the kings took over and rewrote the Bible in about 600 BC. I show how Moses caused dramatic economic growth, how he hated kings but loved people, how he was moral and how he was a feminist, which may come as quite a surprise to most people. And finally, the final appendix is Enoch. Mentioned Enoch so much that I better have a little bit about the original Enoch. Enoch is about how the flood that destroyed the civilization of Sumer is a model for the flood or destruction at the end of our civilization, which is actually quite good news because I've been talking about nuclear war and we naturally think that oh, the whole world's going to be destroyed. Whereas in Sumer, only one city was flooded, but that was enough to destroy the credibility of the rulers. And I'm hoping that it'll be the same this time. 
there will be a nuclear war, but it's possible only only one city will be destroyed. Whatever it is, it will be enough to completely destroy the reputation of those in power, and people see what they'll do to their own people. So hopefully we'll get through this. Uh, end of civilization timeline, when we compare the end of civilization for Sumer to the end of our civilization, the dates parallel quite nicely. And finally, how the Book of Enoch is an example of how mythology is self-correcting. Over the years, of course, the story changed and changed and changed, but because it's dealing with eternal themes and cycles of nature, then thousands of years later, people looked at Enoch and said, this is wrong, this cannot be the case, and they were able to correct it. And the corrected version was closer to the original sources, even though they didn't have the original sources, because they saw how, be how these cycles always work. And that is why mythology is reliable. It's self-correcting. It deals with such big cycles that you can correct them and check them by seeing how the cycles act in your own time and throughout history. And that's the end. And bibliography, a list of interviews with Kirby, other books and resources. Um, about the copyrights, because I have used a number of how to copyright uh, stories. Acknowledgements, uh, don't forget. 2026, the end of democracy. 2040, privatised space travel to other planets. 2065, machines replace skilled humans. 2072, war with China due to global warming. 2090, the first successful humanoid robot. 2021, the great disaster. And the last word goes to Jack Kirby. My stories were true. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you like the book. You can get it from lulu.com, L-U-L-U. -L -U. Just search for Tolworthy or Jack Kirby. Or you can get a free digital copy on my website, tedagame.com, Santor the Endless Do Anything Game.com slash books.